actually. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you all here to discuss a subject uh, that is profoundly, I think, unnerving and not pleasurable. And even as recently as a year or two years ago, probably to many people would have been unthinkable and unimaginable. The notion not only of 9 to 10 percent unemployment in the United States, but sustained high-level unemployment in the United States. And so we're going to take as the main idea for this session, the idea is, is we're going to accept the premise that it's two years from now, three years from now, and we're looking back at this context that began in April of 2009 when we passed 10 percent unemployment and that has continued for one, two, three, four, or five years. So we're going to accept the premise that we are in a high and persistent unemployment environment and begin to talk about the implications of that. We'll talk a little about how that might be avoided, the kinds of things we should do to avoid that, but we're going to try to explore both up here on the panel and with your input this idea, this what if, the United States remains in a jobless recovery in 2011. This is a headline that the World Economic Forum people plucked from a newspaper in 1979, which was you know, maybe the last time there was this degree of structural concern about elements of the US economy. What's been interesting about this to date has been the degree to which most of the experts, some present company uh, excluded in the case of Martin Wolf, uh, missed this coming. Uh, ben Bernanke uh, famously saying that the situation was likely to be able to be contained. This chart, which does not appear large enough for you to make any sense of it, shows the uh, unemployment rate in the United States. And those three lines are the predict uh, predictions of what the worst case scenario for unemployment would be by the OMB, by the White House. And the top line is the Fed, which predicted in the worst case stress testing of the banks. Imagine the worst possible thing that could happen 8.7% unemployment, a number that was passed last spring. And as you'll see, another chart that is unfortunately too small to make sense of, the rate of job recovery as growth has returned has been very, very low indeed. So as we look ahead a couple of years, is it possible to imagine headlines that look like this? Challenges that represent a not only significant structural change to the US economy, but by extension, a structural change to the world economy. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk a little bit up here, but we also very much want to hear your insights. And I think the last thing I'd say before we plunge into exploring this world of what if is that this session, this kind of exchange, is a bit experimental. And so we want to hear from you. Stand up when you're feeling aggravated or you feel somebody says something dumb. Raise your hand. This is a crucial issue for the future of the planet how we would manage a situation like this. And so the more transparent a discussion we have, the more energetic a discussion we can have among ourselves, the more valuable this will be to everybody and to serving the mission of the forum, which is really to improve the state of the world. So with that, let me uh, start with Martin Wolf, who, uh, as a man who needs no introduction, uh, not least because I think in the last 24 months, he has been the uh, primary person who has had the most accurate, compelling view about everything that has unfolded in the financial crisis. And, and its aftermath. Uh, Martin, why don't I start with you? What if the United States remains in a jobless recovery of 2000, 2011? How do you begin to, to think about that question? Well, first of all, I think it's a very much not an if. I think it's an extremely probable outcome, but it's not a certain outcome. So let's just think about uh, why it might not happen. And if we're going to think about that, we should think about how we got where we are. Now, the U.S. economy, from, and I'm just going to think about the, the very macro picture, and others will look at the micro picture. The U.S. economy's performance in the last uh, two or three years has been really very fascinating um, because of the divergence between what has happened with output as measured by GDP, gross domestic product, and what's happened to employment. Uh, and it's, it's an enormous contrast with all the other developed countries that matter, all the big ones. Uh, in terms of output, in my view, largely because of the actions of the Fed and to a lesser degree of the fiscal authorities, uh, the recovery, U.S. output is closer to where it was before the crisis hit. Everybody, all the big countries are still, well, are still below where they were before the crisis hit. But the U.S. is actually closer to where it was before the crisis hit than any other large developed country. So they've done quite well on output. It hasn't been much of a recovery, but you should look at some of the others. 
Now, uh, but the employment uh, shedding has been dramatic. There's been an immense productivity surge. Now, there are two things underlying this. Clearly, the collapse in construction employment, very important. And the second is simply the rate at which American firms have shed labor. And this is colossal contrast with Germany, for example, Britain, where there's been much more effort to, to preserve people, to go to work sharing, temporary work, all sorts of things which preserve employment. So this is, this is really big now. That's relevant to the future. So there are two questions then about the future. The first, which is the way we always think about US recoveries, is how strong will the recovery itself be from now? Generally, growth needs to be 3% above before em employment rises rapidly. But there is a kicker here. There is, and this is sort of the last point I made, there is a possibility that, as it were, the, there are two, there's one, there's a possibility growth will be really strong, and the possibility comes from the, uh, the fact that US corporations are very cash rich, very profitable, and they just might start a really big investment boom at home. I don't believe it, but it's a possibility. Um, uh, the other possibility is that they find they've actually were too nervous, too cautious, they shed too many workers, they actually need more, and that this extraordinary productivity surge we've seen in the US, in quite extraordinary inner deep recession, will be reversed. Unless one, of the, one or both of these two things happen, this isn't a what if, it's what's going to happen, and then I think we should start be discussing how politics, society, business will respond to what then will look rather a European sort of situation. Martin, I just want to dig in. You raised something very important, which is the nature of the kind of unemployment we're looking at now. So there's a profound debate that, that what Martin Wolf has just said touches on that he's written a lot about, which is this question of, is the underlying nature of what's happening to employment in the United States right now, is this a structural change? Is it a shift? There's a phrase in economics for this called hysteresis, which is this idea almost like if you break a ruler or a glass, right, you can't ever get it back together. Is it that kind of structural shift? Or is it just a cyclical shift? Do you want to run us through this debate quickly? Uh, well, very quickly, and there are some economists in the audience, I'll be very interested in their reaction. This is, a, this is indeed a big debate in the United States, and those people, I mean, essentially, it breaks down fairly simply. The, the Keynesians, as it were, who dominate, among others, the thinking of the administration, think it's predominantly cyclical. Of course, there is a structural element because of the collapse of the construction industry. Well, that's obvious. That's happened in Spain, too. It happens in any country when the construction industry collapses. So that th this will be reversed if only demand were strong enough. So the real issue is the incredible weakness of demand. Um, investment would help greatly here. Net exports would help a great he deal here. This is why the exchange rate issue may be important. So that's the demand side. Now, there are others who would say that essentially uh, the, the credit-driven boom of the, of the noughties, as we call it, has masked the reality that a large proportion of the American population has become sort of, in the globalized era, semi-unemployable that the, the, the jobs they used to have have just gone, construction boom sort of masked this, and what is now being created is the sort of mass unemployment of marginal workers, broadly defined, uh, which we've seen actually in continental Europe for much of the last 30 years. This is now really there in the US, and there is no demand expansion which, will, uh, which, is, which won't be highly inflationary, which will offset this. And I would say among the economists at the moment, as usual, there is absolutely no agreement, but those are the two alternative views. And, and based on, I mean, if you had, I mean, there's this notion, you know, the sort of, as you described in the second, of if we had Hoovervilles in the 30, now we sort of have these Obamavilles, which are these unemployed 55-year-old driving around in their minivans, unable to find anything to do. Which, which one of those, you know, where are you falling I think it moment? may not matter for the following reason. I personally think that it is very plausible that demand growth will be weak. And in that situation, and you hinted at this very well with the hysteresis word, in the, that sort of situation, I put this in one column I had, uh, temporary unemployment becomes permanent. Right. If people, we know a lot of this from European experiences, if people cease to be attached to the labor force for a year, two, three, four years, they give up. They, they disappear from the labor force. They lose their skills. They lose their attraction to employers. You need an extraordinary surge in, in demand, you know, World War II, something like that to pull them all back in. So the, the, the temporary demand-efficient unemployment can become structural very easily. That is what happened, I think, in much of Europe. 
And if you are as pessimistic as I am, well, I'm not very pessimistic, but if you're moderately pessimistic about the rate at which demand will pick up in the US because the sources look rather weak, then it could easily become structural even right if right now the dominant reason was cyclical. That's very interesting. So you could have a switch to a new stable That is possible, and that will be the most pessimistic outcome. I've, I've come, come on this so that in any way you converge on the structural outcome if the demand doesn't pick up, and where the hell, where is that going to come from? Uh, good. Well, I want to turn to Dr. Jackson in a second, but as you mentioned, we've got a number of economists in the audience. I'm just curious, uh, people here who are trained in economics, would everybody who thinks this is a structural issue today raise your hand? And everybody who thinks it's cyclical, raise your hand. So the structuralists uh, outweigh the cyclicalists by about two to one. Uh, which indicates possibly that the cyclicalists have somewhere else to be this morning. No, uh, since it's not a very scientific <laughs> it sample. It almost certainly means that the cyclicalists are right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jackson, let me turn to you because I, we've just described one end of the spectrum, which is the Obamavilles, these unemployed people who are at the end of their, their working lives. You're dealing with a lot of students who are at the beginning of their working lives, facing record challenges in finding employment. What does that look like from where you sit, and what does that suggest to you about the, the nature of the educational institution? Well, I, I sit in the higher education sector, and that's an interesting sector in, in different ways. And by the way, Don, I don't know if you could you give 30 seconds on RPI so people understand how significant it is. Uh, I'm the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It's actually the oldest technological university in the United States. Um, more of you may know about MIT. It's like a slightly smaller version, very strong in engineering, in science, in architecture, in certain fields of humanities, arts, and social sciences, particularly media and the arts, and in uh, the management of technology. And so we, we are getting students who are at a different end of the uh, scale. Uh, we get the, 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 among the highest performing students that come out of high schools in the US and around the world. And we have a lot of international demand for our education, uh, particularly those who are interested in uh, engineering and science and, and design and so forth. So when you talk about the higher education sector in the US, uh, there are a couple of points to be made. First, uh, it is not a monolithic sector because there is a difference between uh, what has happened uh, in the public higher education sector and what has happened in the private. And how would you characterize that difference? Well, the, many of the publics uh, have suffered uh, because of what has happened to state budgets. And even though uh, not such a large proportion of the actual budget of most major state universities come, comes from state revenues, it nonetheless is an important component. Yeah. And so that's caused some restructuring and shifts. Private universities primarily have been affected both because of uh, cost issues for potential student bodies and because of what has happened to endowments uh, in the Great Crash. Um, and, but the real question is this. Uh, there are a number of different constructs that are shifting. And uh, Martin talked about an overall shift in the economy, in the employment picture. But there's another kind of construct going on. One relates to that, and one has to do with larger global forces. The one that relates to what Martin talks about has to do with what's happening to families in the US and uh, their choices and their ability to afford higher education for their children, but also their view about whether they can afford higher education. Huh, so tell, that's, me, tell me what that means practically. People are very price sensitive, so they worry a lot about the cost of higher education. And as a consequence, some people are making choices so that those who might go to a four-year university, they opt to go to a two-year. Those who might go to a private may choose to go to a public. Those who go to a private look for a lot more financial aid and support. Now, you said earlier when we were talking that this might be a blessing in disguise. Well. It may be a blessing in disguise in the sense that I didn't quite put it that way. It's very well disguised. That, uh, it's very well disguised. That it may cause a shift in how higher education is organized, how, they are, how universities are run as institutions. 
if you had to guess if we're sitting here in 2011 or because of the pace at which education moves, let's say 2015 or 14, yes. with sustained 9 to 11 percent unemployment, the so-called Obama's 9-11, what, what does that mean to the university structure in the United States? Universities are going to become more, by necessity, more efficient. Uh, the, the makeup of their faculties will change. Uh, there was a lot of partial employment in universities. Uh, I think yeah. a lot of that will change. But I think in the end, the higher education sector has the greatest opportunity to survive, irrespective of what happens with the overall employment picture, because they are, particularly the research universities, the engines of innovation. And they are the pathway to the the kind of education and skills that people need for what I think is happening in the economy. And That's so right. I hope that we talk about what the new economy has to look like and the role of innovation. Great. Well, I hope we will come back to the subject of the next American economy. And, and Michael, I want to turn to you in a second. But before we do that, I just want to give fair warning to David Lee, who I see sitting in the, in the front row, who is the uh, head of the Tsinghua Center for China and the World Economy and uh, sits on the advisory board of the People's Bank of China. One of the points that was just raised about what this would mean internationally, it would be great eventually to turn to you and get a little bit of feedback, if you don't mind. I thought I'd give you some time to think about it, about how high sustained unemployment in the United States might have an impact in China. Can I make one last point, though? Yeah, please, please. I do think there's an impact for the student bodies of universities. Many of the great research universities in the U.S. have had graduate populations that have been predominantly international. Hmm. And so a construct that that one has to think about is while there's still great demand for U.S. higher education, particularly at the graduate level, the rest of the world is evolving and developing and making great investments in, in their university systems. And so more students have opportunity elsewhere. And so I think that has implications. Okay, it's a very good point. Michael, can we turn to you for a view of what's life like on the, tell, tell us what it feels like to be in Los Angeles today trying to balance a, a budget. Well, the problem that Los Angeles County has, along with the other uh, 53 counties in our state, uh, we have a $20 billion deficit at the state level, and we still don't have a budget as I speak to you right now. It's been nearly 70 days since uh, we've been out of sync with, with having that budget. What has that done? Well, the state has now come up with a proposal that they're going to take uh, inmates who have three years or less and have them spend their time in a county jail. It costs the county over 28000 per inmate. The state's going to give us 11000 plus for that inmate and then expect the county to also pick up the mental health and the drug and alcohol rehabilitation and supervision after they are released and also we have to move people out of our jail to accommodate those people coming from the state penitentiary. Just in the past uh, month or so, that cost is uh, it's a, it's a multi-million dollar hit just to our county of Los Angeles. The county has 50, I should say, 88 cities. Los Angeles City is just one of our cities. And we have a million and a half people who live in a community that is not a city. They're called unincorporated areas. If they were a separate city, they'd be one of the... 10 largest cities uh, in the nation. As a result, we have a $23 billion budget. We'd be the 17th largest economy in the world. But when we have unfunded mandates from the state, followed by unfunded mandates from the federal government, we are still responsible to provide that service. And if we fail to do that, we can be sued for failing to provide the service as required by law. So the local governments are asking the state if we have to have these mandates, then once the state does not provide sufficient funding for these mandates, then we don't have a legal responsibility to carry that out so we can keep our budgets in balance. Otherwise, we have to, we're in charge of all the hospitals, the jails, the coroner, the, pro the property taxes. We get you when you're born, we tax you when you're alive, and then the coroner gets you at the end, and we're there full service operation. <laughs> It has a severe impact, along with our multi-billion dollar pension fund. That's having a severe impact. And as a result, many are saying there ought to be some type of a bankruptcy that would take place where you would have a structural reform as to all of your agreements that you have contracted with the various vendors. Otherwise, uh, we, are, we are bankrupt. 
So this is one of these kind of slow lurking variables in the system that we don't pay a lot of attention to. But if we're talking about something that could lead to an acceleration of sort of a, of a phase change in American unemployment, you're talking about a collapse of a lot of the infrastructure that would fundamentally be responsible for blunting something like a 9 to 11 percent unemployment. And we have about a 12.3 percent unemployment rate. Uh, in our central California, we have unemployment that's higher than in Detroit because of uh, some policies. Our, our wonderful fertile uh, agricultural lands have become now wastelands with very high unemployment. And there's going to be a, a dramatic change in, in the legislative representation. Why, why is that? Is food demand down? Well, there was an argument over a fish. And as a result, they cut off some of the water and the supply. And uh, they, others now say the, the fish doesn't have that problem, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the political issues, federal court making a decision, court making a decision instead of the legislature. And, yep. and it's, it has impacted Central California. It impacts Southern California because we are, you know, dependent upon water. So it's, it's a very interesting. And then with hyperinflation, which is around the corner, this is really going to destabilize your local governments right. who are in the forefront in providing the services from public safety and other social services. And we are in a catch-22 position. So really, this is not a situation where high levels of unemployment somehow bring out the best in a system. It becomes more resilient. It becomes better able to sort of ca catch these falling unemployed American citizens and bounce them back. Rather, it's a situation where their unemployment accelerates. It leads to a cascade of problems in the, in the, in the environment that you're trying to manage. We are, whether it's left after everybody goes home, we have to deal with the people who have the problems. Many of those problems created by higher levels of government who've had yep. deficit spending, reckless spending, and expecting the communities to pick up the slack. So with that in mind, let's turn to the American political landscape a little bit. Marjorie, how, how would you characterize both the view today of the implication of, of this high level of unemployment? Did Obama make a huge mistake a year ago in not saying the minute it crossed 10%, this is 100% of my bandwidth? Was that an error or, in fact, a yeah, year ago? I think ago? there was a miscalculation on the part of the administration in terms of um, anticipating what would happen. And I think very traditional views or uh, tools were used to uh, address a very untraditional problem. I don't think people saw that, except right. for Martin, who immediately said that, um, you know, bold, you, this requires bold action. Do you and change the football coach at this point? Is it time for Larry Harvard to... <laughs> Well, I think there's a number of things going on. I think that one of the things that people may not fully appreciate, especially outside the U.S., is that we have a very divided system of government to begin with. It was originally there for some reasons, and now it's working to the detriment, I think, of the country when you have to deal with such difficult problems. So you have two parties that um, the response is really yelling at each other rather than coming up with solutions. And I think the bulk of the, the mood of the American people going into November elections is actually in a very dangerous place. Tell me what you mean I, by that. I think that uh, most people, you know, I think Obama got elected on the platform of change. And I think what was misread, that isn't change of policy, it was change of process. It was change of uh, trying to be more post-partisan. So instead of kind of yelling at each other from one party to the other, of being above that and coming up with solutions. And so he got votes of a lot of people who didn't feel they were particularly Democrats or Republicans, but now were um, their independents. And they, um, they went in one direction where maybe now they feel they've been misled. Yep. And that what they bought isn't what they thought they bought. And there's a buyer's remorse uh, so going So with that, with let that. me take another unscientific poll. Of the Americans in the room, how many think Obama is a one-term president? And of the Americans in the room, how many think he's a two-term president? And of the non-Americans in the room, how many think he's a one-term president? And of the non-Americans, how many think he's a two-term president? All right, well, hopefully he will be running, uh, you'll be able to actually, vote. I actually uh, think there's a very interesting um, point to be made from that. And yeah. that is, I think the view from the outside of the US, and I spend a lot of time outside as well as in Washington, I think the view from the outside is um, that Obama was a big change, change um, in direction, change in the way in which the U.S. operates in the world, change in more collaboration, change in more multilateral solutions to things. And I think the world sees that as a great thing, and I personally do too. 
I think inside the U.S. where the focus is on what we're talking about, which is how do I get my kids to go to college? What do I do every day when I get up? How do I spend my money? Um, you know, is my life, is my, the life of my children, my grandchildren, going to be any better than my own, or is it really going in the other direction? They don't particularly care about the view from the outside. And this is an important dichotomy for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, you know, there's about between 70 and 80 percent of the American people who think the economy is not um, going in the right direction and don't have confidence, which leads to all kinds of issues we'll get into, whether it's consumer spending or investment. Um, but I think the other side of that is that when the mood of the American people is like this and turns inward, we have all kinds of dangerous policies because Congress is a mirror of the people. And, um, you know, you have uh, the dangers of protectionism. You have the dangers of a very um, anti uh, anti-China sentiment, for instance, you have a lot of things that could happen. So your view of the world, though, economically, though, you're, you're still completely pro-free trade, no trade barriers. Absolutely. Okay. I, D David, that's a great note to turn to you, if you don't mind. I, I get David is a, is a very insightful economist. It seems a shame not to get his insights on this. Uh, is there a microphone that David can use? Otherwise, I'll come give you a hug, and uh, you can talk into mine. The microphone is the back there, isn't it? The lady I think they're bringing, yes. bringing one up. David, but, why don't you stand up so they can see yeah. you? David, it's two years from now, 9 to 11% unemployment in the United States. How's that seen from China, and what does it mean economically for China? Well, we would be extremely concerned because knowing the nature of the politics in the U.S., we would know that the exchange rate on China will be the target of blame. In the, in the White House, in, 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 the, in the Capitol Hill, I would say, not, if not the White House. So I would take this opportunity to urge our American friends and the European friends and British friends to think out of the box, to think about new ways of collaboration between China, the US, and the Europe. By this, I mean that we have to go deeper. The collaboration between China and the US should be beyond between Zhongnanhai and White House should really go to the county to county level. Hmm. Like China should really go out and find ways to collaborate with counties <coughs> like Los Angeles, counties like Washington in, in Detroit, right? That way we can help the structural change in the US and in the process we can prosper at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a very interesting issue. It's another one of these things where when you're operating in a systemic environment where everything is connected, so the subprime crisis is connected to the real economy, as we now discover. And David's point is something like unemployment in the United States becomes connected to currency policy. So you have a regime shift in one area that might lead to a profound regime shift in another area. So one of the ways that people argue that the United States is very resilient against these kinds of shifts, um, and particularly often in contrast with places like China, is as a very robust civil society. Uh, and a lot of NGOs that function and serve an important uh, role in trying to sort of backstop areas where, where the government itself can't work. Uh, to what degree, as you look to the future, do you see that as being a, a, a piece of the puzzle here? Well, I think it will be a piece of the puzzle if the NGOs and the organizations that work in urban communities fundamentally shift how they imagine their work to be. So let me give you an example in terms of workforce training. A lot of the work I do is in urban communities in the United States where somewhat marginal people want to join the economic mainstream of the United States and there are job training programs and other services that help move people into jobs that exist amongst regular employers. And that's the fundamental way that the work gets done. That's how governments fund organizations that are NGOs to do this work. And with the structural unemployment that we're already experiencing, that model no longer works. To some extent, we were canaries in the coal mine where for several years, our, the primary job of organizations that I work at and with was to help prepare people for employment. They already learned two and three and four years ago there was no absorptive capacity of regular employers to take them on. And now, as this becomes more structural, as it becomes just a given that if you live in a particularly poor community, it's increasingly unlikely you'll be able to get employed no matter whether there's a job training program that the city of Los Angeles or the federal government pays for, 
NGOs are going to have to think, and the, the federal government is going to have to fund a very different job creation strategy within these communities rather than a job training strategy. I can get, tell you that I have two touch points into this issue. I teach also at Stanford University, which sim similar to Rensselaer, has some of the most selective students who come. And when we had a crisis, people were bemoaning the fact that it took them three months to get a job after they graduated, as opposed to having jobs waiting for them, as opposed to people in the urban communities who now are looking at two, three, several years of being unemployed. So this inequity that is continuing to grow in the United States is particularly being felt by a larger and larger number of people, numbers of people. And so the federal government and the NGOs that, that should be the backstop can no longer operate with the current model. And that's what's going to have to change. Martin, if I made you Minister of Labor of the United States tomorrow, are there, are there any policies you've heard that, I mean, this, this issue about long-term structural unemployment, people not being able to find jobs, I mean, what, what sort of programs to put people to work have you heard about that struck you as interesting? Before I answer that, I just want to make one comment which interests me about the political salience of unemployment. Uh, and there are sort of two views of this among uh, analysts. There's a very cynical view, which is that what matters is not the level politically, it's the change. Hmm. And the reason is, very roughly, and this is very much European experience, once unemployment stabilizes, most people who have jobs are reasonably comfortable with the idea they're going to keep it, and the people who, are, who don't have jobs sort of disappear. And who cares about them? So you get used to high unemployment. And uh, one of the most striking things that happened, and this is why the, relevant, the reference is so powerful to me, in the continent, it's often forgotten. Before the 70s, the average rate of unemployment in continental Europe was 2% or less, right? Much lower than the US. From the 80s onwards, it was 10%, right? Did this create revolutionary politics? Well, you know, our, our politics would have sort of be wildly left. There used to be communist parties then. No, everybody got used to it because everybody gets used to the idea of high unemployment and the people who are unemployed, they're poor, they end up in prison, whatever. The other view is that the US is different because it doesn't have the same sort of social safety nets as continental Europe. There clearly aren't going to be more because the resistance is to taxes so that uh, th there will be much more fear as a result of the fact that you know, this becomes a real possibility. I think it's a very important question about how the politics of high unemployment will play out in the US, and I don't know the answer. I'd be very interested in other people's reaction. What can you do about it? Well, there are broadly speaking, you know, the economists would speak, uh, there, are, there, are, there are the following uh, three rough things you can do. You can really be serious about creating demand, and uh, that means wildly bigger uh, mon more aggressive monetary and fiscal policies than we've seen so far. I happen to be one of those mad, quote-unquote, people who think that should happen, but it's not going to happen. But that would be going for broke on demand. The second thing you can do is really do something about incentives at the macro. I'm talking macro level. Right. And, I mean, I think one of the great missed opportunities of the quote-unquote stimulus is that they didn't use it as an opportunity, basically, to get rid of payroll taxes for five years. Right basically shift relative prices in a very big way. The sort of spending, and the, the tax cuts that are now under discussion are also irrelevant to this, right. as well as the stimulus. All the discussion on the structure of spending and or tax cuts in the US strikes me as amazingly irrelevant. The third thing you can do is actually start messing around with the labor market directly. As I've already pointed out, the Germans have essentially subsidized, uh, supported work sharing. We think of the German economy as very successful. They've actually cushioned the, 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 the shedding of workers. You could think of jobs programs. The U.S. used to do jobs programs. They don't do them anymore, but when I lived there in the 70s, they did jobs programs. You can do lots of those, uh, and they could be much more effective, again, than the sort of stimulus you've, you've had. What has struck me as extraordinary, given the scale of the deficits the U.S. has been running, is how unimaginative they have been yeah. about making them more job friendly. I see no sign of that changing, but there are clearly things you could do that could ameliorate this extraordinary job losses, which have been associated with what, as I've told you already, has been a really, believe it or not, relatively mild recession right. by the standards of the world. It's an extraordinary achievement, quote unquote, that the US, which was the epicenter of this crisis, has had such a really mild recession. Yeah. Can, I, can I just challenge one sure, thing Martin. that Martin said? Um, you know, and this is about the uh, relevance of the tax discussion. 
Because I'm also uh, chairing a group of um, uh, women business owners, 1,600 business owners that account for about 100,000 jobs. Um, and the thing that the tax cuts, the discussion about these rich people over $250,000, a lot of them are small business owners, which has always in the United States been a great source of uh, new jobs, innovation, and uh, services. And um, one of the things that is of great concern is that uh, when there has been high unemployment, you know, a lot of people can, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurship that happens, so there's a lot of lending. All those tools are not going to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, lending is harder, and if these tax cuts do, um, if the, uh, there is an end to the tax cuts for people over $250,000, a number of those people are people who have small business, and that's the money they invest in the new jobs, and we're going to lose the ability the flexibility to address this from a grassroots level, because it's clear that at the federal level, we have all the things that Martin's talking about. Surely that's fixable with tax policy, right? Can I just, uh, yeah. Martin, yeah, go Can ahead. Can I just comment on the comment, because this is a big issue, of course. Uh, the question is, the difference in the tax rate, marginal tax rates for, uh, for the relevant group is, as I understand it, slightly over three percentage points. Uh, I really find it very, very difficult to believe that that alone is going to make a fundamental difference to, to, uh, to job creation. Maybe the symbolic aspects of it are important for small, uh, for, for small business. But we really are talking about, and this is one of the strange things about this, we're really talking about a difference in marginal tax rates, which just seems to me too small to matter. Now, when Reagan cut tax rates from 70%, that's a really big deal. But right. what's so astonishing is the whole heated, massive debate about, I think it's 3.6 percentage points, so maybe it's 3.4, somebody will correct me. This isn't serious. Uh, I'm sorry, Marjorie, I always agree with you, but on this I really <laughs> disagree. I think this tax debate in the U.S. is unbelievably I, depressing. I think it is uh, symbolic. And in, um, I mean, if it's symbolic, that's even more frightening because yeah. there are so much bigger <laughs> issues. Michael, you want Let to Let me just say that. You talk about the $250,000 uh, uh, having uh, another 3% plus uh, tax increase. That, they're already paying over 50% in taxes. When you put in the sales tax, 10% or whatever, in California, the sales taxes that you have uh, with your state tax is about 10 plus percent in California. Sales tax is 10% uh, and 10.4%. Uh, We're talking about 50% or more just in taxes. And taxes aren't creating the new jobs. You need to motivate the private sector. In California, it takes 25 private sector jobs to employ one state employee. So the answer is to get more people working or having an economic incentive package. That's what President Reagan had done when he came in with double digit inflation, 21% prime rate, a high unemployment rate, about 13%. And he reduced the corporate tax from 70 plus percent to I think it was 28%. Yeah. And you had some Motivation and the economy picked up, and he slowed down domestic spending. But when Congress continues to spend by printing money, those of us in local government have laws against bankruptcies. We're left in a catch-22 position. We need to have people working in good jobs. We need to have our schools providing good training and having educational scholarships so kids in failing schools will have an opportunity to go to a school to get a college education by getting good grades in, in high school. And our, our colleges, they have to start focusing on major, major academics so that people are prepared. Some of these majors that we have today, we're just babysitting for four years. And that's not right. We need well, to get I, back to uh, not having more scientists, engineers, and doctors. They built this building where we are today in eight months. The architect was telling my deputy this morning, who also has an office in Georgia, you can't do that in the United States, can you? And he laughed. He laughed. I'm not saying we can do eight months in the United States, but we can certainly streamline our bureaucracies to be productive because they don't produce the jobs. It's the private sector that makes the engine run. We've got people on both sides of you who want to respond to that, which is good. And I just want to give fair warning that after these two responses, right. we'll, we'll turn to the audience to try to get some, some, some input. We'll uh, work our way down the panel. So, Rick, let's start with you. So, just quickly, I, th I think this debate you're hearing about this relatively small amount of tax change shows some of the dilemmas in U.S. politics. That, you know, there is this profound structural problem going on in the United States about a significant number of people now unemployable. 
And this is, uh, this is not really the issue, at least from my perspective, about whether there's 39 or 36 percent rate on the highest end of our incomes. That's not the issue, but that's been cre that is presented as if that's the issue in, in the United States and if that's the solution. So leaving aside the argument whether it is or is not the solution, which I don't believe it is, it suggests that we have this big structural problem going on in the United States that a significant number of people with uh, lower skills are either there's no jobs for them. And unless we have a fundamentally different approach in the United States about job creation strategies, not the source of capital is it higher wealthy folks or whatever, which is not really going to solve it, as we've learned in the past. But what are we going to do about you know, government's role and the industry's role and the, and the nonprofit civil society's role about innovations in social businesses, which could in fact- And, and Rick, you hinted something. So your view is we get another two years into 9 to 11% unemployment. Does the American political environment become more cohesive or more divisive? Well, I'm certainly struck uh, uh, by Martin's suggestion <clears throat> that uh, this will be unexplored territory for us. Will people have- Politically, you mean? Well, p personally and, and emotionally, will people feel so worried about jobs that they'll actually feel differently than the Tea Party folks, which is that, that this is the main motivation for the sort of the right wing reaction to the United States. Right. People feel a lot of anxiety. Obama happens to be the president now and they're being uh, very effectively uh, channeled towards uh, defeating or uh, sta uh, creating stagnation in our but country. What's your, we're trying to play the what if game. Yes. What's your instinct? American politics, more divisive, more more coherent in a couple years. Well, I think, it'll, it, I think it'll be a constructive divisiveness because I think there's a lot of social innovations that are in fact going on uh, in the United States that could create new forms of job creation strategies, which in fact, uh, what, if, if, if there is in, in fact two more years of this, uh, innovation will, will blossom. Is constructive divisiveness the tagline for Fox News these days? Or that, that we're <laughs> well, that's, Do, Dr. Jackson, you, you were going to weigh in here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am not an economist. I'm a physicist. And if you look uh, over the last 50 years, if you look over the last 60 years, uh, and you look at you know, what the employment has been, let, we talk about construction. In, in the Great Recession, meaning since we had the big downturn, about 2 million manufacturing jobs have been lost, and about 3 million construction jobs have been lost. And you could ask the following question. You see, and that's where a lot of the chronic unemployment's going to remain. And, and why might that be? If you actually look at manufacturing, as a per, manufacturing employment as a percentage of total employment, it has dropped monotonically Absolutely. for the last 50 years. Right. Now, we've had an exacerbation within the last couple of years that have highlighted this trend. The only time since 1940 where manufacturing employment went up was in the 40s, right. and that was fundamentally related to a war effort. But other than that, manufacturing employment has gone monotonically down. And you could say why. And what I would say the why is has to do with the introduction of technology <clears throat> and an increasing kind of productivity uh, all the time. Women went to work so that Families could try to keep their uh, incomes at a certain level. People worked longer hours. But now, people got to a point where they started leveraging up. And they leveraged a lot based on what they thought they had in the value of their homes. And with that whole bubble bursting, and I don't think it's, that's coming back soon, that affects the employment in, in the construction. So let me take so, so no, let me finish oh, yeah. because you gotta have the context. So now we can talk about the taxes, and I have thoughts about those. But innovation is the key. Innovation and education. And those are things we don't spend time talking about. We argue about differential tax rates that may be three percent, they may be five percent, they may be two percent. And municipalities are squeezed. I see it. I live in a small town in upstate New York. But in the end, we can talk about those things till the cows come home. And so the question becomes, what are we willing to invest in? Right. So what and kind of innovation policy would you like to see? Tomorrow? I would like to see the following. First of all, an innovation ecosystem requires about four things. One, strategic focus. What are some common goals? Where's the world going? 
where does one need to really think about investing? Secondly, you never have innovation. What, what would that strategic focus be? Well, of course, I happen to believe that you have to look at uh, energy, energy security, look at the nexus with water, and water is becoming a big uh, issue in the United States. Right, but this president wants well the most globally. ambitious new energy program okay. in American history. Do you think it's insufficient? Well, I mean, this president, <laughs> and I happen to, you know, be on an advisory panel, has, you know, made more investments in the, you know, green energy. And, and more focus there. But let's look at demographic trends. People are getting older. So, you know, health care is going to become a bigger and bigger issue. And, and if we're well, going to... Well, the president to, just passed health care reform. Well, let me finish, please. Okay. If, if we're going to deal with providing the health care people should have, but not have the cost explode, we need innovation in process, in technology, in delivery of medical care, in, in how you know, uh, healthcare is organized in the use of new technologies to streamline and optimize what we do, therein lies opportunity. So you look at the need to, uh, for energy security with environmental stewardship. You, need, you have an aging population, you need to look at uh, healthcare, et cetera. Right. You have to think about where you will invest. That's strategic focus. Secondly, you got to have ideas. And if you don't have breakthrough ideas and people who are innovators, nothing's going to happen. And that requires the willingness to continue to invest in basic research and to support and have a, a system that spawns uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. The third thing you need is infrastructure. And you need a new type of infrastructure. Yes, we've got to repair our roads. Yes, we've got to fix up the grid. But if you're going to do those things, think about broadband investments. Think about what kind of grid you're really going to need if you are going to have smart grids. But I mean, again, just I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this president has also launched the most ambitious national internet infrastructure program, and he's spending as a factor of 10 times more than the last administration. Do you think that's insufficient also? I think we have to have multi-sector cooperation. But, but yes, I mean, we've gone through a list of these policies. I hate to interrupt you, but I just, we're trying to explain to people. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. I, I think Obama has focused on the right things, if that's what you're asking me. To, but you whether think they're I too agree. small? Well, I think it's not a, you, it cannot just be driven from the federal government. It has to be private sector involvement. Universities have to educate people to right. be able to do these things. So you, there's no silver bullet. There's no one sector bullet. And... And that's where the common wheel has to come together. That's where the civil discussion has to take us. Right. And until and unless we have that discussion and are able to have those investments, then we aren't going to get anywhere. And finally, we better deal with baseline education for everybody. But again, I'm, this president has launched the most ambitious educational spending in the last you know, in 40 years. You think it's insufficient? I think it, it is definitely the right, in the right arena. But as long as this gentleman is still dealing with the kinds of things he's dealing with in inner cities, right. with the folks coming to college relatively unprepared, we haven't tackled the problem. This is a beginning, but we got to see it through to the end. But as you think about this as a physical system, the reason I ask you just because, you know, for those of I, I live in China, I've lived here for the last eight years, yes. we're about to have the announcement of the 12th five-year plan in October. Yes which addresses at a very specific level a lot of the things that you're talking about. You are among the foremost Americans who are really on the cutting edge of this because you deal both with the education problem and you are deeply connected into the business community. I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say, if you were writing the, the 12th five-year plan for the United States, how would it be different from what is, what is out there today? Well, what would be different from what is out there today is a couple of things. One, we would make the fundamental investments that we need to make in key areas of, of research. We would uh, incent companies to continue their focus in research, development, and innovation. We would think of ways for uh, companies to uh, redo their own infrastructure, uh, their plants and equipment, move to modern manufacturing techniques yep. through the right combination of tax policies as well as uh, providing 
perhaps shared infrastructure. Well, I think it touched on Martin's uh, Right, and, and so the, all of these yeah. are things, and, and then we have to fundamentally invest in human capital. If you, you can talk a good game, and you can talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, but the last time I checked, innovation comes from innovators, and innovators are people. And so if right. you don't have a focus on uh, the education of young people from, from the very beginning, as well as what happens in higher education, and you can't destroy the higher education system as you go along because, you know, we are, we've had, we're the model everybody's emulating. Yeah. So when people do five-year plans, they're not unaware of what has made the U.S. the yeah, world's right. strongest economy. Marjorie, yeah. you wanting to get we, in. Yeah, we have a fundamental problem. I mean, you know, I think the contrast with the Chinese uh, five-year plan is a, a really interesting launching point. Obama has these ideas, um, the White House, whether you agree with them, you don't agree with them, we have a structure, a political structure that is not working right now. And it's causing a lot of um, the inability to take, even if there are bold ideas, to work them through the process. We have a divided government. We, unless we find a bipartisan way or some political will um, to take that forward, we can't <coughs> execute even on the great ideas, and that and fundamentally causes a problem. And to play off this what-if scenario, problem. two years down the road, two more years of 9-11 uh, unemployment, right. America less cohesive or more cohesive politically? I'll answer it in one second, because Martin and I were talking yeah. about this last night. One of the other things that is different now than before is that the U you know, in the, in the past we've had television networks that give people a common view of the world. Mm -hmm. And now we have a very bifurcated system of communications in the United States. So everybody is watching things that are a mirror of themselves. So it's very hard to build the kind of consensus you could build at one time before. And it's an important point because to answer your question about whether we have more partisanship or less partisanship, um, right. I think that it has to co the, the uh, common concerns have to come from somewhere. Um, I, I'm an optimist by nature. I don't think we can go on like this. Um, I hope the American public will be angry enough to. But what, what is the uh, make realist in you say? The realist in me says that um, that whenever we um, have a um, a platonic shift in the Congress, then um, we tend to get more cooperation. So if so, you think a Republican Congress launching investigations against the White House will be easier to cooperate no. with than a. I don't. You're asking two years from now? I right. do think, I mean, we'll be, well, two, two years year, from now we'll have a Republican we'll, Congress. Well, two we? years from now we also will um, be up for uh, re-election at the presidential level. So nothing right. will be very cohesive at that point. I think that will be very it's divided. Safe bet. You had a quick point you wanted to make, Rick, before we... Uh, well, the conversation has moved on, uh, so I, I'll leave okay. it at that. Okay. I don't, I don't want to miss the chance to go to the floor, um, and in a totally unsystematic fashion, I'm just going to start at the left and work my way across. And I've got to get people out of here in seven minutes, so... I'm not sure what being on the left in China actually means. Um, You'll get a better seat uh, on the way back to Beijing. Uh, I, I hope that's right. Uh, at the risk say who of, you are. At, I'm Tony Miller. I'm a, a, a hedge fund manager based in uh, Hong Kong and Tokyo. Uh, at, at the risk of uh, engaging in potential controversy, um, I'd like to ask partic particularly Mr. Ramo and, and Mr. Wolf, um, how did we get into this uh, uh, mess and how much of a role do you think China's uh, uh, pegged uh, uh, renminbi and and uh, policies that, that caused, uh, that allowed America to, to borrow aggressively for uh, the better part of a decade uh, uh, had a role in perhaps even uh, a responsibility in, in uh, uh, America's Martin, is the, the blame for the America's economic problems lying here in Beijing? Or in I Beijing? knew that question would come. Um, I'm always painted in a corner on this. Uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that this is the single most important global policy distortion, right? I have no doubt about this. I've written about this. However, as my Chinese friends would immediately respond, the fact that we bought lots of treasuries didn't oblige you to go and waste it on building, waste it indirectly on building houses nobody needed for people who didn't want them. And in the, 
and in addition to allow the financial system to become so fragile that the slightest little tw wind would blow the whole thing down. So my view is this is one of the background conditions for the crisis. It is possible, but certainly not, I think probable, but certainly not certain that it would have not have happened in, in, uh, in a more balanced global economy, but I don't think the Chinese can be blamed for the sensational mess made of the Western financial system. And uh, quickly, because I want to get to other people, let me ask you two questions. Is that a widespread view in the hedge fund community that China is somehow to blame for this? And secondly, you mentioned you're based in Tokyo. China has been a major buyer of Japanese debt over the last uh, 12 months. Is that a scenario you see unfolding there? And is that partly why this is on your mind? Um, I think the, the hedge fund community does not uh, uh, view uh, China as culpable or, or and, and I think subscribe to uh, Mr. Wolf's uh, view almost completely. Uh, having said that, the American political system probably does uh, view China as as being culpable, and I think that that will have repercussions in the next. Anything two years. to worry about in Japan? Um, and and I think look, Japan is even further uh, along to the I don't know if it's the left or the right in terms of protecting employment. They've been through a 10-year, maybe 15-year downturn, and never had unemployment go over five percent. Mm. Uh, uh, that's that's almost a, a, a perfect reaction and something that maybe America could learn something well, from. Well, it's a very interesting statistic. Let's work our way across the guy in the red tie in the front row. Don't forget the ones in the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mark Kennedy with Chartwell USA. Uh, one of the things you hear talked about a lot in the business community we haven't talked about much, and that's uncertainty and risk. And when there's uncertainty and risk, what's required to invest goes way up, and that's why businesses aren't investing. Some in business would suggest that Obama has increased uncertainty as much as Reagan cut those taxes from 70% down to, down to 28 with the uncertainty of what's this health care going to do, which is still out there because the regulations aren't passed. What's it going to do to businesses? What is the cap on carbon going to do in terms of further restrictions? What is the banking bill going to do in terms yep. of reducing our ability? I'm just only going to cut you off in the interest of time. It's a very good so question. So the question is, is, Dr. is Jackson, how much of a, a factor is that? As a board member, you're, are you seeing this uncertainty impacting decisions being made in the corporate suites? Well, both as a board member and as a former regulator, I do think regulatory certainty uh, is important because it does lay the groundwork for uh, investment and other decisions. So I don't disagree with you. We, that. we see but that. But it's not just something that I think the administration owns. I think the whole political system owns. Right. Marjorie. We see that with a lot of our clients. I mean, we're, uh, there's a vast amount of money that's being sat on by uh, companies uh, especially uh, in the uncertainty and of is that, the But is US. that legitimate regulatory uncertainty in response to policies that have been made, or is it uncertainty because they don't understand what's going on in the environment and they're, they're blaming it on the administration? No, I think there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. I think that when you get down to specifics about how much is health insurance going to cost for the next five years, um, there's so many regulations coming out of the new laws, it's going to take a long time to sort through it. Okay. When you talk about um, what is tax policy going to be long term? I'm only going to cut is, you off because you've okay. made your point and it's a okay. very good one. There's somebody in the back who's got a question, been uh, raising his hand very aggressively and has a familiar uh, uh -huh. oh. face to most of <laughs> us. Who is this man? <laughs> Martin, I, I want to try to bring your point and Shirley's point together if I could as I uh, have great sympathy for her argument. Um, World War II provided a huge uh, stimulus for demand, but also provided a huge advance in innovation. And it was that advance in innovation, whether it's radios, transport, air, air traffic, that we then played off after World War II to quickly pay off all that debt. What worries me about the argument that just says, just increase demand, demand, demand now, is, you know, road building, shovel, do, what is the assurance that it can, it can stimulate the kind of innovation that Shirley's talking about so we can actually pay it back in any reasonable time without blowing out the currency? I think the view I've held, first of all, I think this is one of the best demonstrations of the fundamental truth that while the Americans believe that their economy was built by private enterprise, government has played an enormous role all the way back to Alexander Hamilton, who has somehow disappeared from discussion. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, my assumption has tended to be, and this may be wrong, I've followed your writing closely, that America remains whatever the huge problem of the financial sector, fundamentally the, the forefront of innovation in the world. 
And it seems to me obvious that's the case. It remains the case, provided they don't destroy the tertiary higher education system or the rest of it. So I've always assumed that if the basic economy works, if you don't allow the financial system to go crazy, you manage the government in a moderately sensible way, the supply side in the US will work. Whether that, if that is wrong, all I can say is you really have a big problem. And, and Tom's point, we actually got to something which I know you have written about, which is the nature of productive government policy on things like innovation policy or industrial policy. Do you think it's possible for the political system in the U.S. to develop something that can Under do what you said? Under current circumstances, I would love to know whether anyone uh, disagrees. Under current circumstances, the answer surely is no. No. And, and Tom, just to pull you quickly, uh, the American financial system uh, or American political system with sustained 9 to 11 percent unemployment, more cohesive or more divisive? Yeah. I would say more divisive. I think uh, to, to go to, and I don't remember your name, but uh, I think you made a wonderful point. I think Barack Obama was elected to change the polls, not read the polls. And um, it turned out that he wanted to read the polls, not change the polls. On that, uh, I'm getting body language signs from the very nice people at the WEF. Thank you all for coming. Let's hope this is a what if that does not come true. Thank you to the panel for an engaged and uh, invigorating discussion. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.